Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's Wound Care Today Facebook Live. I um, hope you've had a fantastic summer. I hope you got some sun. It's been very rainy here. Um, and thank you for joining. Um, we're both well aware how busy you guys are. Um, tonight's event is called Healing Burns with Microworld, a new animated way to learn. And our legendary speaker joins us now. Good evening, Chrissy. Good evening, everyone. Are you well? I'm very well, thank you. Very excited. It's been long awaited. I couldn't wait for this module to come out. We're finally here. I can't wait to get started. Well, look, thank you for your time. Thank you for your commitment. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, um, Chrissy's doing this from home, even though it looks slightly like the Louvre in Paris. Um, so if we have any technology problems, please bear with us, and I promise you we'll get them sorted out as soon as possible. The link for your certificate of attendance will be made available towards the end of tonight's event, and that will count towards your revalidation and CPD. Um, and a question that's always asked is, yes, this will be on our website as a video within 24 hours for your colleagues who aren't registered on Facebook. So that will be on the Wound Care Today website. Um, as Chrissy would agree, um, the more involved you are, um, the better it is for the event. So please comment. But also any questions, please feel free to ask and we will endeavour to answer them or as many as possible of them uh, towards the end of tonight's event. Um, this is module nine of Microworld. Uh, we've done stuff on wound healing, on exudate management, wound infection, um, the moist assessment tool. We've done stuff on DFUs, VLUs, pressure injury, incisional care and now burns. Um, we have incredibly over 11,000 registered members now in Microworld from over 40 countries across the globe. It's translated into seven different languages. So guys, for those out there who are already on Microworld, who've joined the Merry Band, um, a massive thank you from me. And for those watching who aren't aware of Microworld, please get involved. Uh, you can join at mymicworld.online. Uh, play the games, uh, have a look at the modules, and let us know what you think. Your feedback is massively important. Um, before I start, just a big thank you to our global partners for Microworld, who are Mernlicker. Um, without their partnership, this event's not happening, and without their partnership, uh, Microworld wouldn't exist. Um, your commitment to and passion for independent education is quite remarkable. So a huge thank you from me and, and everyone who's worked on Microworld from the UK people on the Get Animated team. Um, so without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to our awesome speaker tonight, over to you, Chrissy. Thank you so much, Ed. Hello, and welcome to finally to class nine on Burns. I'm Chrissy Stiles, and I'm Burns and Plastic Surgery Nurse Specialist working at Pioneer Wound Healing and Lymphedema Centers. And today I will be introducing you to the latest Microworld class. Class nine is on burns and has been developed to help you understand the key principles of burn assessment and management and how Microworld can help you to achieve this in a fun and engaging way. So welcome to class nine on burns. Uh, as you will know, if any of you follow me, you will know that I am incredibly passionate about burn care. So uh, it gives me a great pleasure to be part of this module. Um, and I would like to introduce what we're going to cover. So this time, as class nine, we'll focus on burns and we'll explain complex and non-complex burns and how they're defined the causes, many, many causes of burns, including the most common causes of injury, first aid, my favorite subject, and why it is key in preventing injury progression, holistic assessment, which is broken down into two parts, primary and secondary burn assessment, how to manage non-complex burns, when you should refer burns for a specialist intervention, and what aftercare information you should give your patients to optimize their outcomes. 
So burns can be caused by many different mechanisms, which makes their management a little bit challenging. It is important to identify the mechanism of injury as it may influence how the person with the burn is managed, particularly when first aid is delivered. Thermal burn injuries are most common and occur following contact with a heat source. So this includes scalds, which are caused by contact with hot liquid or steam. Flame injuries are caused by direct or indirect exposure to a flame source while contact injuries arise from contact with an extremely hot solid object, or maybe less hot object, but for a prolonged period of time. Electrical burns occur when electricity flows through the body, both internal and external tissue along the path of entry to exit is damaged. So electrical burns should always be referred to a specialist center. Similarly, chemical burns should always be referred for specialist intervention too. Chemical burns are frequently caused by either acidic or alkali substances, which continue to corrode the tissues until completely removed by irrigation. Then there's radiation burns, which are caused by prolonged exposure to the ultraviolet rays of the sun, commonly experienced as sunburn. We all know what that feels like. They can also result from exposure to other sources of radiation, such as X-ray or radiotherapy treatment. Friction burns result from contact with an abrasive surface combined with heat. This is worsened by high speed. And then finally, cold burns, also known as frostbite. They're caused by exposure to freezing temperatures that restrict blood flow to such an extent that it results in skin and tissue damage. It commonly affects the extremities as blood is diverted to the main organs in cold environments, but if it's prolonged, results in tissue death. So now we know more about the causes of burns, let's meet our patient who's busy making his breakfast at home. That's going to hurt. And leave a mark, or more specifically, a burn. A burn is an injury to the skin or other organic tissue primarily caused by heat, hot liquids, solids or flames, or due to radiation, radioactivity, electricity, friction or contact with chemicals. Scalds, on the other hand, occur when there's contact with hot steam or liquid. But before we delve further, it seems our patient needs to address the smoke. And where there's smoke, there's an alarm, summoning none other than the Microworld team. The team look like they're enjoying some downtime. But that won't be for too long. First, they have to get to the burn. So, as we have just seen, the patient has suffered from a thermal contact burn after accidentally placing his hand on the hot metal of the pan handle. This and any other burn results in injury that can be divided into three three-dimensional zones. The first zone is known as the zone of coagulation. This is the very center of the burn where the most damage occurs. It is made of dead and devitalized tissue that has been irreversibly damaged and cannot be saved by treatment. It must be removed to enable the healing. Next, and expanding outwards from the zone of coagulation is the zone of stasis. The tissue here is not necessarily destroyed beyond repair. It may have reduced tissue perfusion, but has the potential to heal with optimal first aid and treatment in the hours following the injury. However, this tissue can be lost if the correct steps are not taken, resulting in larger wound for the patient. And finally, the zone of hyperemia. It's the outermost part of the burn, and it's characterized by vasodilation and inflammatory changes. There is good tissue perfusion here, meaning that the tissue is viable with good perfusion and is very likely to recover with treatment. As I just briefly mentioned, first aid is really important. This is really the key step in preventing the burn injury from worsening and increasing the chances of good outcome for the patient. Depending on the cause of injury, the key first steps are Stop the burning process. So if the person is on fire, you get them to stop, cover their face, 
drop and roll to extinguish the any flames. Next, remove the patient to a safe place without endangering yourself. Remove any non-adhered clothes and jewelry, which could result in restricted blood flow as swelling starts to occur. And remember, remove nappies in infants and very young children. This often gets forgotten. Next, the focus should be on removing the heat from the wound by cooling with tepid running water for at least 20 minutes. This removes heat from the wound to prevent worsening of the injury and further tissue loss. Ideally, this should be done immediately, but it is also effective up to three hours after the burn has occurred. Once cool, the wound should be covered with cling film, also known as GLAD or Saran wrap, depending on your location, or if not available, a clean cotton sheet or something similar to protect the wound from contamination. Covering the wound can also help with the pain caused by the loss of tissue and exposure of the nerve endings. Cling film should remain in place whilst the patient is being transferred for assessment in a clinical setting. Do not apply creams or anything similar during first aid. They can mask the injury and they may need to be removed so that assessment can be carried out. And this can result in much further pain for your patient. Appropriate systemic pain relief should also be given to the patient, depending on what is available and suitable for that individual. At this stage, non-complex burns can undergo wound assessment, whilst complex burns should be referred to a specialist burn service for further assessment and intervention. So how do we determine the wound severity? Well, the cause of the burn contributes to its severity along with its depth, the total body surface area that it covers, and its location, and also the likelihood of inhalation injury. Other patient-related factors, including age and patient history, also need consideration. Any medical or psychological or psychosocial factors that may impact upon the patient recovery should also be factored in. All of this information can be used to determine if a wound is complex or non-complex. So non-complex burns were previously known as minor burns. So a burn can be described as non-complex if it is a thermal burn that does not affect all the layers of the skin. So this is known as a partial thickness burn. In children, non-complex burns are those that cover less than 10% of the total body surface area or in under ones, less than 5%. In adults, non-complex burn covers less than 15% of the total body surface area. For a burn to be classed as non-complex, it must not be in a location that will affect function. For example, on the hands, on the feet, any joints, face, or genital areas. And finally, a non-complex burn may also be a deep dermal burn that affects less than 1% of the body. In contrast, complex burns are those that will take a while to repair. They may compromise function or which may need interventions such as excision and grafting in order to heal. For this reason, complex burns will require referral to a specialist service to maximize healing outcomes for your patient. So what is a complex burn? It is any thermal burn injury affecting a critical functional area. A burn that covers more than 15% total body surface area in adults, or more than 10% in children, or more than 5% in children under a year. All chemical and electrical burns are considered complex, and in electrical burns, this is because the potential for unseen internal damage and for chemical burns, the potential for ongoing and worsening burn injury until fully irrigated. So remember, too, that complex burns can result in a dysregulated inflammatory and immune response within a few hours of injury, and that can be life-threatening. So to recap, when treating a patient with a burn, remember that burn injury is dynamic with changes occurring in the tissues for up to 72 hours after the injury. Within the burn, 
the zone of stasis is the area where compromised tissue can be saved or lost, depending on our initial management. Suboptimal care can result in further tissue loss, which will deepen and widen the wound, potentially resulting in increased severity of the wound despite initial assessment over the next 48 hour period. Conversely, tissue in the zone can also be preserved with swift intervention. Remember too, that all burns result in local inflammatory response, which triggers repair of the wound. In complex burns, however, this can also trigger a systemic response that can be life-threatening. We use assessment to determine complexity of the burn, and we will now discuss this in more detail. So once first aid has been administered, assessment is needed to determine the extent of the injury. This is split into primary assessment, in which the aim is to identify and stabilize any life-threatening injury as a priority. And this can then be followed with a secondary wound-specific assessment to help to establish the best way to treat the patient, which includes identifying when referral might be needed. We will discuss the criteria for referral shortly, but for now, we'll focus on assessment. The mnemonic ABCDEF can be used to guide primary assessment to make sure all the key priorities are considered when determining the status of the patient. A represents airway maintenance. The loss of airway is often progressive in the burn patient, so securing a patent airway becomes much more challenging over time. If there's any doubt about the airway patency or for patient safety, early intubation is often advised. Under B, you check the patient's breathing and ventilation. You should have a high index of suspicion for inhalation injury in any patient with respiratory distress presenting with dyspnea, strider, any voice changes, any signs of upper airway edema, deep facial burns, any sooty sputum coming up and being coughed up, and a history of a flame burn in an enclosed space. There are also two bad gases involved in combustion, carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide. These cause direct systemic toxicity. Carbon monoxide binds readily to hemoglobin and it displaces oxygen out of the patient's system, which causes reduced oxygen delivery to the tissues, especially to the heart and the brain. And hydrogen cyanide acts as a chemical asphyxiant at a cellular level, resulting in tissue hypoxia. So look out for signs suggestive of smoke inhalation injury. Look out for burns to the mouth, the nose and pharynx, other head and neck burns, any singed facial hairs, or soot on the face or sooty sputum. Does your patient have difficulty breathing? Do they have increased respiratory rate, increased effort in breathing? Do they have flaring nostrils or tracheal tug? Are they using their accessory respiratory muscles? And always listen out for any productive or hoarse brassy cough, croup-like breathing, any changes of their voice, and in spiritual strider. Always provide supplemental oxygen. That's 100% high flow, so you're 15 liters per minute by a non-rebreather mask. Also, beware of deep circumferential chest burns in adults or chest and abdominal burns in children, which can significantly impair ventilation. These may require an escarotomy, which is a surgical incision used to decompress the burn escar. Under C, you check the circulation and cardiac status. Don't forget to specifically look for evidence of hemorrhage with these patients. Check for blood pressure, heart rate, and any abnormal pulses, capillary refill and temperature, whether peripherally and centrally. And aim to insert two large bore IV lines, ideally in non-burn skin. Under D, for disability neurological status, you need to establish the level of consciousness using AFPU scale and check for pupil responses. Under exposure, we remove clothing or any other items and control the environment around the patient. Remember, 
the loss of the largest organ, the skin. The larger the burn wound surface area, the more devastating the evaporative heat losses in your patient. Keep the patient warm and their wounds covered. Preserve body temperature through ambient temperature control and passive and active warming measures. To prevent further heat loss during your assessment, use a segmental method to assess burn size. And remember to assess both anterior and posterior surfaces. And finally, fluid resuscitation proportional to burn size. Fluids are initially given using the modified Parkland formula for any burn in an adult that's bigger than 20% surface area, in the child that's bigger than 10% surface area. The formula requires patients weight in kilos and an estimation of the burn percentage total body surface area. It is calculated from the time of burn, not the time of assessment, the time of burn, and is guided by the hourly urine output as the recommended clinical measure of adequate fluid resuscitation and end organ perfusion. So once your patient's considered stable, a secondary assessment of the burn injury can now be performed. So let's see what that involves. Secondary assessment refers to burn specific assessment and should consider wound related factors such as wound depth, burn size as a percentage of total body surface area and consideration of the local wound conditions so you can guide your wound management decisions. It's also worth mentioning again that analgesia should be provided throughout all the care pathways as burns can be incredibly painful both continuously and intermittently when undergoing wound procedures. It's important to assess wound depth to help figure out the expectations for healing. So for example, is the wound likely to heal on its own within three weeks or will it require excision and a skin graft to allow healing to take place? Wound depth is categorized according to the tissues affected by the injury. And it can be classed as superficial, superficial partial thickness, deep partial thickness, also known as deep dermal, or full thickness. Superficial burns are those that affect the epidermis or outermost layer of the skin without any blistering. Although superficial, they can be very painful and red and erythematous. These wounds usually heal quickly within a normal time frame. Superficial partial thickness burns extend into the uppermost layers of the second layer of the skin, the dermis, and present with blistering and a lot of pain. Deep partial thickness burns extend deeper into the dermis, but not as far as the underlying muscle and bone. The extent of the tissue loss can prolong healing and cause scarring and loss of or changes in skin pigmentation. And finally, full thickness burns result in the loss of all skin, extending to the underlying structures, including muscle and bone. These are severe. They're very debilitating and they will not heal without surgical intervention. As discussed earlier, remember that burn depth may increase over time as part of that dynamic process that occurs in the zone of stasis within the 72 hours following injury. This is known as burn wound conversion and means that reassessment is actually recommended again on day three post burn to determine the extent of the tissue loss. Remember too that burn wounds are usually uniform in depth. However, they contain a mix of deep and superficial components which should be noted and treatment should cater to the predominant depth extent and also should guide your referral. The percentage of total body surface area of a burn helps you to identify severity and prognosis and also will inform the clinician on how best to manage the injury. So there are several different methods for establishing total body surface area of a wound in a clinical practice. These might be familiar to you. So one of them is Palmer surface. Another one is Wallace's rule of nine. And another one is Lund and Browder chart. The London Browder chart is commonly used and is considered the most accurate way to assess a burn area. 
The chart is available in different age ranges, so factoring in any variation in body shape with growth. For example, London Browder charts are available for babies, children within the age ranges of 2, 5 and 10, and for adults. Once the relevant chart has been selected according to the individual patient's age, a calculation can then be made. A calculation of percentage of total body surface area is made by shading the areas on the chart and calculating the values together. This can take a little time to record and calculate all the values, but if used correctly, it is accurate and is probably the most universally used tool for burn area calculation in both adults and children. There are also some smartphone and tablet applications that are based on London Browder template, like Mersey Burns app or eBurn app, that are developed to aid clinicians in the assessment of total burn surface area and calculation of fluid resuscitation. If you haven't tried them, check them out. The wound size and depth should be considered in the context of the patient history to make sure that any treatment decisions you make are appropriate for the individual and that any factors that may affect their healing outcomes are taken into account and addressed where possible. So give consideration to their medical history. So any comorbidities that may affect treatment or the healing of the burn this may include patients with significant comorbidities like diabetes or your immunocompromised patients. Consider the patient's age, burns in neonates under 28 days old or any unwell or febrile child with a burn. Generally, young children and older adults over 60, these age groups are the most vulnerable and will have a deeper burn than an adult for any given temperature. Consider social history and it's especially important to raise safeguarding concerns for any burns with suspicion of non-accidental injuries. Patients' nutritional status must be borne in mind. This may be something that you note alongside the burn that potentially hasn't healed over the last two weeks, or if the burn, say, changes in appearance or shows signs of infection, or are any concern about healing, always consider nutritional status alongside of those factors. And also consider first aid, whether first aid was delivered, when was it given, was it appropriate, was it applied for an appropriate length of time, and if it wasn't given or inappropriate first aid was given, is there still time for you to administer first aid? Pain, as I mentioned, is a key factor for consideration throughout the care pathway during the first day, during the assessment and treatment of any patient with a burn injury. Burns can be and often are extremely painful. And so pain assessment should be carried out as a regular intervals, analgesia being given as appropriate to the patient and provided before any painful intervention. Effective pain management should follow a structured approach, such as the World Health Organization's analgesic ladder, which recommends medication according to the level of pain encountered, using your non-opiates, weak opiates, and strong opiates. Non-complex burns result in a wound, so the principles of wound management will always apply. First, wound cleansing and debridement are essential to remove devitalized tissue and any foreign materials from the wound bed to provide a healthy base from which healing can now occur. You can learn all about wound healing in detail in very first class in Microworld. Cleansing and debridement may be performed as a one-off procedure or may need to be carried out several times to remove dead tissue until the wound bed can be fully seen. The debridement method used should be selected with consideration of the wound location, the amount of devitalized tissue present, competency of the clinician and preferences of the patient. In some cases, surgical debridement under sedation or general anesthesia may be necessary. Similarly, any blister that are larger than the patient's small fingernail size should be deroofed to permit full visibility of the wound bed. Remember that the skin in the blister is dead, as it is separated from the lower skin layers by blister fluid. The blistered skin therefore needs to be removed. Blisters on the palm of the hand should be left intact, 
as the roofing is very painful here unless they affect function. A moist wound environment should be created to promote quick healing. A wound dressing should be used to achieve this and should be selected based on the local wound conditions and other factors such as availability, cost effectiveness and patient preference. Of course, to promote healing, it is important to maintain a moist wound environment since this helps healing to occur more quickly than a wound that is exposed to the air. A moist wound healing environment can be achieved by using a suitable wound dressing. The dressing should be selected according to the local wound conditions, the health of the surrounding skin, your dressing availability, patient choice and preference. Burn injuries can often produce a large amount of wound exudate, so desirable dressing for burns should be able to absorb and retain this exudate. It also needs to be able to reduce pain, act as a barrier to the environment to prevent any infection, and provide protection from knocks and further trauma. The dressing should adhere to the skin surrounding the wound without causing pain and skin damage when you're going to remove it. If the skin is fragile, a non-adhesive dressing may be required. Remember, as healing occurs, the local conditions of the wound can change, so the dressing used may also need to be changed. For example, a less absorbent dressing can be used as exudate volume reduces, or an antimicrobial dressing can be used if local infection is present. Remember to consider referral at all stages. The National Burn Care Referral Guidance suggests that there is a minimum threshold for referral into your specialised burn care services. And it asks clinicians to refer all burns that are bigger than 2% in children or 3% in adults. It asks you to refer all full thickness burns because now we know they won't heal without surgery. All circumferential burns, these are the deep burns that go all the way around something. So. It's essential to refer these because they can compromise breathing if they're, for example, on the chest or the patient's neck, or they compromise viability if it's on a limb or on a digit. Any burn that's not healed in two weeks, because we potentially have only one week left to graft and optimize patient's healing outcome. Any burn with suspicion of non-accidental injury should always be referred within 24 hours of the assessment. In addition to this, there are some factors that should prompt a discussion with a specialist burn care service and consideration given to a referral. So burns to hands, feet, face, perineum or genitalia, these are functionally, aesthetically and psychologically important areas and would hugely benefit from the multidisciplinary team resources that are available in the specialist burn team. Any chemical or electrical or friction burns, these generally tend to be deep, may have a systemic impact on your patient and will need the support of a specialist burn team. Any cold injury, because these pose a high risk of amputation, your unwell or febrile child with a burn, you should have concerns potentially about toxic shock syndrome, which has high rates of mortality. And if there is any suspicion of toxic toxic shock syndrome, then you should definitely refer. Um, any concerns regarding burn injuries and comorbidities that may affect treatment or healing of the burn, burns that take longer than 21 days to heal, they're more likely to develop problem scarring, so they're best being seen and treated in a specialist service. And for the same reasons, the burn wound changes in appearance or you notice that there are signs of infection, or you have concerns as to why the wound is not healing, again, pick up the phone and check in with the specialist burn service. If all above and all these thresholds are not met, then continue your local care. But remember that burn services are always there for you to pick up the phone and seek advice if you ever need to. And finally, patient education is so important this should include aftercare instructions and follow-up details, and it's essential aid for their recovery. Continuing care involves aspects such as general health maintenance, skin care, itch and scar management, as well as psychological support. 
The patient and their care or family should be supported and provided with the information they need to optimize their health and wound outcomes. So I hope you've enjoyed the introduction to class nine on burns and the snippets we have shown you here. When you reach the end of the class, you will get a brief recap of the content and you can then take a quick test of your knowledge. Remember, completing the module also will open up other areas of the site, giving you access to further content. You can also monitor your progress on your own personalized dashboard. Here you can access new content, view your activity, and visually track, monitor, and analyze your performance, all in one place. But sadly, this introduction to class nine is coming to an end. I hope that this Facebook Live has helped you to understand a little bit more about burns, about their causes and the importance of first aid and halting injury. You should also appreciate how to access a burn injury, how do you assess it, how do you recognize the key elements and what you need to consider when deciding whether you can treat it locally or whether a specialist referral is required. I hope you now understand more about what constitutes good burn management, including selection of an appropriate dressing. And finally, I hope you have recognized how MicroWorld can help you to learn about burns and other wounds in a fun and enjoyable way. If you enjoyed the session, please visit MicroWorld and register for free and access all nine classes and additional bonus content. We hope you have fun learning all about wounds. Thank you for attending, and class is now dismissed. Over to Ed. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, thank you massively. Um, thank you to our audience for your comments, your questions. Um, as you can see on the slide there, as Chrissy said, please register. We want you involved. Um, we want your comments. We want to know what you want to see next year. Our next module's on cleansing and debridement coming out early next year. But after that, we'd love your guidance. There's some really cool content on the Monica platforms. So again, that's on your screen right now and should be as well in the comment section. So guys, thank you so much. Chrissy, if you get a second, watch it again. because There's some fascinating comments and um, a, a huge audience. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, should we crack on with the questions? Let's um, do I'm it. People are busy. So um, question number one, one second. Uh, let me get it in front of me. Um, from Joe Hadfield, how can you tell how many layers of the skin a burn has affected? It's a really good question. As in fact, one of the more challenging things about trying to assess the burn depth. Um, so as I mentioned, burns are generally dynamic wounds. So you have to be very mindful as to when the burn injury happened and when your assessment is taking place. Because potentially what you're seeing on day one could be very different by day two and day three. It's that 72 hour window. So whilst there is all the classification systems and we know what layers of the dermis have been affected or not, ultimately there are two parameters that give me really good indication as to how deep the burn injury is. If I prod and poke, does the patient go, ow, stop it? If they do, that means their nerve endings are intact and the wound bed is reasonably viable to give me an impression that actually only the top layers of the dermis have been affected. If all of a sudden they're going, oh, don't worry, it doesn't hurt, keep going, it's fine. You start getting concerned that actually the injury is much deeper and the nerve endings are affected. The other element that you should check for is the capillary refill, the presence or absence of blood flow into the wound. If you're doing capillary refill, you depress for five seconds, you let go, and you have brisk return of blood flow back to that depressed area, you know that the blood supply is viable. If you're depressing and nothing happens or actually takes really, really long time to refill, you have some concerns about the tissue viability and the blood supply to and from. So if you've got ouch and good blood flow, it's a reasonably superficial depth. Whereas if the patient is not feeling at all any pain or some pain that's kind of distant and the blood flow is affected, it's a much deeper burn and you should be concerned and definitely considering a referral. So those are my tips. Two things, circulation and pain. Chrissy, thank you. Um, question two, there seems to be confusion 
in some areas of clinical about blisters and if they should be left intact or re-roofed. Could you please offer some guidance on this? So we mentioned that all blisters that are bigger than the patient's small fingernail size should be de-roofed unless they're on the palmar surfaces because they, these areas are painful. Ultimately, what we're talking about is the tissue that is dead and has lifted away from all of the blood supply, so it's no longer viable. As a result, it acts as a bacterial attraction. Um, and unless we remove it, unfortunately, it would draw more likely to draw infection towards it. So the guidance from the British Burn Association is to deroof all blisters. So all non-viable tissue has to be lifted has to be removed because actually if you dress a blister with whatever clever dressing you might choose to apply you're dressing dead necrotic non-viable tissue and you're not actually managing the wound bed itself you need to be able to visualize the wound itself the wound bed so you can do your assessment of good capillary refill or pain or what is the depth what is the size and for that you have to unfortunately remove all blistered skin for the patient, it is not a very ple pleasant experience, which is why we keep banging on about how important pain management is. You wouldn't go anywhere near your patient until you've given them adequate analgesia and you've given it time to work. So you can't just give it and then go start de-roofing. It is unpleasant. Ultimately, we are not generally giving them a general anesthetic, so it will be still unpleasant, but you have to pre-warn your patient, this is what I need to do, this is why I need to do it, and I will spend the least amount of time doing it because I'm going to be confident and decisive about it. Remove the non-viable tissue, then I can assess, and then I can start pressing. So the guidance ultimately is actually quite clear-cut. All blisters that are bigger than the small fingernail size of your patient all of them have to be de-roofed. I would say that on the palmar surface areas and on the soles of the feet, blisters that are there, the skin is much thicker. So actually, if you leave the blister intact, it starts to compromise patient's function. And if they have to walk on those big blisters on the soles of their feet, that's also going to be incredibly uncomfortable. It creates pressure into the wound bed and potentially can compromise blood flow. So again, the guidance is to, if you're not deroofing the whole of the blister, cut a big enough window into that thick blister so you can visualize the wound bed, release the liquid out of the blister and release the pressure and then you can dress it. And eventually over time, you will decide whether that tissue is actually dried out and can be removed further down the line or whether sometimes it re-adheres and then becomes a biological dressing eventually to fall away later. Um, Christy, that's one of the great comprehensive answers in seven years of Facebook Lives. So thank you. Um, next question. Um, you mentioned referral during the presentation. There seems to be a lot of factors to consider. Can you provide any guidance on simplifying the decision-making process? Well, <clears throat> as you heard me rattle on, all of the referral criteria and all the discussion points that the National Referral Guidance tells us we must uh, apply, and that's the threshold for referral into specialist services. It is overwhelming and uh, clinicians who work outside of the burn services wouldn't be guilty of, of feeling that these burn care specialists, they're very fussy about who they want to see because it sounds like we want to see everyone. Um, and it's not wrong because we know these injuries and what happens as a consequence of these injuries may be healing in a less optimal way or without the support of the therapy and psychotherapy that we have available within the burn care team. So we are fussy. We do ask for anything you're concerned about, anything you're not sure about, pick up the phone and speak to us. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a referral. Actually, you could just say, I've heard Facebook Live. Chrissy Style spoke, spoke about this. I've forgotten half the stuff she said. So can, you, can I just check with you what I need to do now? And that's perfectly fine. Please phone up, pick up the phone. We'd rather you got in touch earlier than later because the consequence of healing is scarring. If the patients take longer than three weeks to heal, the, the sadness of, of the burn wound healing is scarring. And the scarring has a life of its own. Scarring continues to mature over up to two years after the wound is healed. 
And we as wound care practitioners often don't see patients, whereas on the burn services, we do see our patients further down the line with scars, managing scars, scars that become tight and itchy and contracted and split under tension, don't sweat, that cause an extraordinary amount of problems, even on the little surface areas, affecting function, affecting confidence, affecting our place in society. So that's why we're so fussy with referral criteria. Anything you're concerned about, refer. Anything you're not sure about, refer or speak to the burn service. And any area that's injured on your patient, if it was you and if it was injured on you, would you want a specialist to treat it? If the answer is yes, you pick up the phone and you ring us. I um, I one you don't rattle because you mentioned that you're rattling on, and two I know how much I can see the comments coming through, so I know how appreciative the audience are of this insight. So I think we've got a couple more questions. So if you don't mind, I'll keep going. Keep going. Um, this is from Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. Um. What would you consider as the most suitable primary dressing? So there isn't a right or a wrong answer. Um, I think the majority of issues come with lack of availability. So if I, as a specialist, might say whatever my preference might be, um, it is quite frustrating for clinicians in primary care or even secondary care who don't have access to um, some dressings. So my preference would be for whatever dressing you have, that is atraumatic, non-adherent, that's actually going to improve and encourage wound healing environment for that patient, that it's suitable for the location where it is. So if you expect them to move, then make sure that the dressing can accommodate for that or that you're seeing them more frequently for that reason. Um, and ultimately, it, it needs to be within your remit, within your knowledge of that dressing. So a lot of... Um, aftercare, a lot of follow-ups in the burn services are quite often because of the dressings that have been either left on too long or keep being changed too frequently. So know your dressing products that you have, know what it does and what it definitely doesn't do. How long can you leave it on before you need to check it? And also for some dressings, we need to consider the ambient environment. So if we're in a very, very hot summer, please, um, then maybe the dressing might dry out over time. So maybe we need to change it more frequently. So there isn't a, a, an optimal answer. The only answer that I will say more definitively than that is that for children, we don't mess about. For children, we use silicon-based uh, atraumatic dressings that are definitely not going to stick, that are as atraumatic as we can possibly make it at the point of removal. Because if we mess it up on their first dressing change, on the next dressing change, you're never gonna get them through the door again. They will never let you anywhere near them. And um, people in the audience who deal with pediatric patients, no doubt will be nodding to this. So uh, we want to make it as um, atraumatic for, for children as possible. So silicon um, based products is what we would go to for that. Brilliant, thank you. So question five, what advice would you give to everyday practitioners to help them avoid a common error when managing people with non-complex burns? So we already talked about how to assess depth um, and we talked about all the various um, guides that we have for assessing burn size. And ultimately, these two parameters, size and depth, are what will tell you whether the burn injury is complex or non-complex. Um, so if in doubt, again, reach out to the burn service, um, but equally stay within your, your own kind of scope of practice, stay within your limitations of your knowledge. So if you, if you know, address it. If you don't know, pick up the phone. One of the most common issues aside from the depth and the size assessment errors are, and actually don't feel bad because even the specialists are only 75% accurate with our size and depth estimation. So it, please don't feel bad that this is, we all get it wrong on occasion as well. So that's why we ask a friend. Um, but one of the key things I would say that it's really important to get right is separating the digits during dressing. Um, it seems like an out there and a really odd thing to say. And for those of you who already practice this, it might sound really odd that I would say this. But actually, when you're dressing even the tiny little fingers on the children and babies, it's so important to separate every individual digit. 
because if you dress them together and wrap them up and bind them, obviously the longer you leave it, the more likely they are to, to morph together and start growing on top of each other. So you A, want the patient's functional areas to remain as functional as possible. So if you give the fingers separation or toes separation under a foot, Whereas if you make them close together or give them a boxing glove, that is how it will stay. So from long-term outcome, you're actually encouraging stiffness in the joints. You're encouraging contracture, which is much harder to manage in the long term. So separate each single digit as you dress it and encourage your patients to move. Whenever my patients would come to me in clinic and their dressings are messy and half falling off and they say, well, you know, you told me to get back and do things. So I went and did things fantastic this is exactly what you want you want them to come with stuff that's fallen off because they've been using their fingers so make it so that they can use their hands and their toes. brilliant so listen i just looked at the time so we're going to do one more question um to our audience i know there are more questions out there so what we'll try and do is come back to you after the event and answer all the questions that are coming through so last question um can you touch on the role of grafts in burn management. Are there any special care considerations for donor site wounds? Oh, donor sites. So um, this is in case of, um, if we go on to do a skin graft operation, in order to heal an, an injury that's potentially deep dermal or full thickness, you need to do surgical excision. So you're removing the dead damaged skin, ultimately leaving a viable, very bleedy area that now is skinless and needs to be covered. So in order for that to be covered, we need to create a second wound in the patient, and that is called a donor site. A donor site is uninjured area of the patient's body where we harvest the top layers of their skin and apply it to the injured burnt area. The donor site, as you can imagine, is an incredibly painful area. In fact, it is probably the more painful part of the patient's body, and it's a wound that we've created. It is very bleedy because it is superficially harvested, so it's got very good vascular supply. And the dressings that are quite often applied are there to stay for a very long time. Ideally, we put it on and we leave it. And in fact, a lot of burn services you tend to use hyperfix or mefix directly onto the donor site. I know a lot of you will be cringing and wondering what the hell is Chrissy talking about, um, but this is the approach. So after the donor site is harvested, you have a very bleedy wound that has hyperfix or mefix applied directly on, and then it's padded with a pressure dressing that stays on for about 48 hours. After 48 hours, the padded dressing comes away and the mefix stays put. And it stays put, looking really horrendous and looking brown and leaking through and until it finally dries to air and eventually that donor site heals underneath it. And what happens is as the wound begins to heal, that donor site is healing, hyperfix or mefix starts to lift off. It generally dries out like a crust, like a crusty wound, and the crust starts to peel off. And the advice to patients or the nurses that are at the bedside or the nurses that are looking after these donor sites is to cut away the lifting mefix, but leave the mefix alone. If it's still attached to the wound, you leave it. We do not touch it because if you go whipping that off, you're creating, again, an open wound that's painful, that's going to bleed, and it's going to be a really, really tricky wound to heal. So that's if it goes well. But sometimes these also get infected and actually take much longer to, um, to heal than the actual skin graft itself. Skin graft is healed within a couple of weeks and the donor sites continues looking green, but often gets pseudomonas in it. And then you are in the world of pain because then you're moving on to your wound care expertise and you manage it as a wound that's becoming a little bit more chronic and potentially you need to manage the wound conditions. And for that, I do not have a specific answer. You see what's in front of you and you manage it the way that you do. But if they come out with the Mifix dressings on out of the burn service and you're the nurse at the bedside scratching your head wondering what have burn service done with it, it's for the reason that we use it as a crust, a dressing that is there to stay until the wound bed is dried out and fully healed. 
And the management of it often is as though you're managing your skin. Patients advise to shower over the top of it, wash it with soap over the top of it, dry it out to air, and eventually within a couple of weeks, that Mefix lifts off and you have a lovely, lovely discolored, slightly pink um, uh, area, but ultimately healed. So that's the donor sites, but do watch out for those. And if in doubt, please contact the burn services to say, what am I meant to do with this? Can I have some advice? Because it can be confusing some of the dressings that we send patients home with. So check in. Chrissy, you've been an absolute star. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, our hour is up. There are four things I've written down for you to do. One, please download the certificate of attendance. This will count towards revalidation CPD. Um, our legendary Lindsay, who right now is typing very quickly, that should be up on the screen. The second thing is please register and join the Microworld community. Um, the more the merrier, but also your feedback is massive for us. So get involved, tell us what you'd like to see. Um, as discussed before, there's some fa really fantastic content on the Mernica site with regards to burns. So again, that link will be coming up now. Um, and last but not least, next week we are launching the website for next year's Wound Care Today. So if you'd like to meet um, the Microworld team, if you'd like to meet some of the Microworld characters, please come to Wound Care Today in Telford on the 12th and 13th of March. So that's that. Some massive thank yous. Chrissy, thank you to you. I know how much work you and Nicola have put into the slides over the last few months. So thank you so much. To our partners in Malika, um, thank you again for your support and trust. To our incredible teams that get animated and mold digital and at Wound Care today, um, I know how much work goes on behind the scenes. Um, so thank you from me. And last but not least, to you guys who've come in your in your in your huge numbers. Um, we know how hard you work. You continue to inspire um, us all um, at the JCN and Wound Care today. Um, stay safe. Stay strong. We look forward to seeing you very soon. And thank you so much for tonight. Goodbye. Good evening.